Welcome to the Kingdom of Pod. Jeff Caves here in Flower Mound, Texas. Today, an update on Kellen Moore, his status with Dallas and Carolina, his prospects of being an NFL head coach. Also, take a look at Boise State and some things that are happening with the State Board of Education that should be of interest and concern to the athletic department and the folks who are trying to build Boise State football and uh, the other sports. The recruiting rankings from ESPN uh, declaring a new number one recruiting school or power in the Mountain West Conference, at least for now, uh, some portal updates, etc. cetera. Thank you for joining me here on the Kingdom of Pod. This is a deep dive into Boise State football news as I see fit, sometimes a couple times a week, sometimes less. It depends on exactly what's going on. And anytime Kellen Moore is in the news, I think we're all interested to some degree in interview with the Carolina Panthers and there I have a long list of candidates, and there is no inside information here that's saying Kellen has got the job. You know, Dan Quinn's going back for another interview. I think it's in Denver. So it takes one to two to three interviews. We have no clue what's going on uh, behind the scenes. Yes, there are some challenges in Dallas uh, with fans and their attitudes, which is all public stuff that I'm sure that uh, the Jones family is aware of. And they also know the reality of what they're dealing with because they're not only, you know, with Kellen now looking at even year five as a coordinator, uh, they've got bigger fish to fry. Dak Prescott being at the biggest fish in that, I guess, bucket getting ready to go into the oil fret of the off season. And I think, you know, seven years of Dak Prescott, they know what they have and there are worse quarterbacks that can get to Super Bowls with better uh, people around them. Uh, I personally think Dallas is a well one or two offensive weapons short on the offensive side, specifically tight end and another dominant wide receiver. You know, defensively, they've done such a great job of coaching up who they have, adding some new pieces and parts. And um, I, I think that defense is good enough to get to a Super Bowl, but you know, any given year, there's a lot of injuries that can dominate this. But let, let's get back to Kellen. I uh, was just reading up and and thinking more and more about, you know, who he is and what he was brought in to do. And I think there's some sense to saying that if you want to get the most out of Dak Prescott, Dak Prescott you got to have Kellen Moore there to explain things to him and to propel him forward. Uh, I, I'd say that at this point, it's it's probably fair to say that he's taken him as far as he can. Uh, I don't think that's a stretch. And that's not a criticism either of Kellen Moore or of Dak Prescott. That's human nature. I don't know that Dak would have gotten these huge contracts, uh, the $30, $35 million salaries he's looking at, uh, his status as an endorser, um, arguably the highest profile position in all of sports, in America at least. And, you know, Kellen's role in all of it is, is obvious. Uh, is he a tutor? Was he a mentor? Uh, did he break things down to make it all make sense to Dak? I would think so. Uh, is that what's still needed to get the most out of Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys uh, into a Super Bowl? Probably not. Uh, does Kellen know any and all of that? Yeah, pretty sharp guy. Uh, it is the NFL, and there would be plenty of suitors for Kellen uh, should he uh, move out? It would not fit the Jones style uh, to fire Kellen Moore, to not bring him back. He's got another year in his contract, and uh, it's Doug Nussmeyer's contract that's expiring. They could, as a public relations move, suggest he's the quarterback's coach, and we're going to get a different voice from Kellen to the quarterback's coach to, to Dak. That's who you see on the sidelines oftentimes uh, most closely sitting next to Dak Prescott. I don't know about any and all of that. Um, his fit in Carolina, you know, is there a Dak Prescott sitting there? No. Do they need a young quarterback? Yeah. Uh, did, did somebody as experienced as Kellen with bringing a quarterback up to speed to NFL standards and propelling an organization forward, could he do for X quarterback that he did for Dak Prescott? Why not? Um, that's up to Carolina to figure out. I, I think one of the things that's most interesting to me about Kellen Moore, the head football coach, is that it's such an administrative job and it's such an image-oriented job with the men who look up to you 
on how you make decisions that we're all on the outside. A yeah, very private person uh, does not give away literally anything in media opportunity interviews that he does weekly as the offensive coordinator. Very similar to the Kellen that we heard uh, when he was at Boise State, right from a sort of a Chris Peterson tree of uh, treating the public face differently than perhaps what's going on behind closed doors. There is room for all kinds of different leaders and leadership styles in the NFL to become winners. You don't all have to be screamers. You, 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 you don't all have to be Tom Landry types. You don't all have to be Bill Parcells. You can go down the line. Look at Bill Belichick without Tom Brady. Hasn't been any Super Bowls in his future. Sometimes it does come down to a combination of, of talents and people. So the most interesting piece to me is how would Kellen, the administrator, handle running an entire pro football organization, which is a billion-dollar proposition? These are billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar businesses. And he's in charge of the most important part of it. And that's the product on the field. Uh, there's so much that goes into player decisions and player personnel and how he would work with another general manager or player personnel guy that is unknown to me. Uh, would he stand up for what he believes? Would he want to look, learn, and listen from a very experienced person or somewhere in the middle? It's just a lot of the same type of thinking that we should apply to any business situation when you're out looking for a new CEO or general manager or whatever type of administratively authoritative position we need to hire. Uh, I do know that when Kellen sat down with Carolina, uh, he probably had you know a three-ring binder like this. This is what I would do with your organization. He's a meticulously well-prepared person. I think what's one of the more beautiful things about Kellen Moore, from my experience of others' thoughts about him that I have met in and around pro football, is that he has a sixth, sixth sense, a quiet demeanor of being the smartest person in the room without making somebody feel stupid. And, and that's not his – I don't think that uh, – that's necessarily on purpose by Kellen. I just think that's his nature. He respects and enjoys other people, looks for the best in them, and knows that strategically speaking, he needs to stay a couple of steps ahead of where he's taking an offense in the Cowboys case or in the Carolinas case, where he's taking an organization. He builds confidence in those who are around him based on those types of principles in that Here's where I'm taking this company, or here's where I'm taking this team, this offense, and here's why. And as the players, after the executives have bought off on it, see that, they get some aha moments like, that's brilliant. you know. And that was a lot of the reactions that the Cowboys had when Kellen Moore took over that offense, that he was brilliant. He, he was saying things that made a lot of sense and was we're out of the box. And, you know, I, I still see him coaching that way somewhat in looking at some of the Cowboys formations that, that they run some of the heavy sets, you know, putting offensive linemen in the offensive backfield running Dak less, but at the right time, there's just some things that he's done. I think that are very smart savvy. Uh, so I'd like to see that three ring notebook, uh, It'd be impressive to understand his total organizational philosophy. And I, I believe that one day we will, and you'll just have to get into the weeds to look closer. If he gets a head coaching job at the people who are around him, where they come from and who they are. Uh, and that's all we can say for now. I imagine the next couple of pieces of news we'll get is if Carolina continues to pursue other people, then sometimes that's a sign they've moved on from whoever they've already spoken to. Uh, let me talk to you about full spectrum health. Now, for the last couple of weeks, uh, I have been doing a combination of things to try to feel better, to sleep better, to yes, lose some weight, and to change my energy levels. And I wanted to affect this in a, in a different way than some of the dieting methods I've taken in the past. And so Full Spectrum Health has helped me do that. It's a very simple program. Uh, a lot of the eating principles are keto-based, and you can eat more in the morning, and then you're not as hungry during the day and the afternoon, and there's not as many crashes. 
You can get all the details and you can get a free consultation. If you want to do the program, it's like 200 bucks or less for eight weeks. It's a no brainer. You wake up, uh, you, you, you want to look at sunrises. You want to understand how your body works with the sun and how it works without it and how it works with the things you eat and when you sleep and when you can't sleep and why. Uh, this could be a great opportunity for you. And I think the killer is the cold plunging. So get the details for yourself. Get the free consult. Hit full dash spectrum health. That's full dash spectrumhealth.com. You'll get a custom fitness and nutrition plan, an eight week coaching program. You're not going to regret this. It won't cost you more than 200 bucks. It cost you a lot less. Depends what you want to do. You can all do a video consult and everything. It's easy and it's very effective but it's not for everybody. Trust me. Email me with any questions. Hit it. Full-spectrumhealth.com. That's full-spectrumhealth.com. All right, let me get back to another conversation that's happening. This time, uh, much higher scale and, and much different. I was reading about uh, Dr. Trump's conversations at the State Board of Education. And, you know, one of the things I've talked about through the years that I've observed is how much greater it would be if there was a lot more higher education support uh, in the state of Idaho uh, for the, the, the universities uh, and Lewis and Clark College and, and, and anybody else that's trying to improve our minds so that we can move uh, forward. And I was reading about Dr. Trump getting grilled uh, by you know the state board or the state legislators who were talking to her about, you know, how much she's paying speakers, let's see here, uh, why they need another $1.8 million to replace uh, cars, lab equipment, uh, take care of the floors, why you need more AV equipment and computer equipment, uh, why you need $1.4 million for forklifts, trucks, tools, uh, photocopiers, lawn equipment. When you're getting in the weeds like that uh, with a CEO of Trump's uh, position, you have another agenda. And to antagonize, to question, to threaten, to embarrass, and not to improve, move forward, and make this whole thing go better. I don't believe that. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, in the situation that she was in, when she was asked certain questions about paying for people who were in charge of inclusion or diversity or all the different evolutions of higher education, frankly, that have come on, um, whether they're done for political reasons or real life improvement reasons or somewhere in between, that's not for me to judge because I'm not behind the scenes. Uh, I just know the optics of that for many different universities and corporations across the country. Um, it's just too bad. And she didn't have answers for what they were going to pay some of those types of positions because it's so far in the weeds that, you know what, <laughs> Can I get back? Can I email you that? Because we have such bigger issues to discuss here. So if there is any hope that uh, Dr. Trump can ever get the State Board of Education or the state legislators to see the value in giving Boise State more money and access, they're telling her, no, there is not. And it's going to take another approach from her or approach from somebody else to do it differently. <laughs> I don't know how long she will want to um, continue to go into this environment, go deal with the people running the state of Idaho and get drilled about forklifts and buying uh, diesel trucks. That's that's sad. That's too bad. That's not putting the uh, state ahead of politics, but that's that's what she's dealing with. Speaking of politics, for years we've all seen – the recruiting ratings for maybe Brandon Huffman and 247 Sports um, and others dip into it. There's rivals. There's other places to get information. I prefer 247 Sports. Uh, I enjoy uh, looking at what's going on and being said or written uh, by fans at, say, uh, Bronco Country, uh, which is a 247 Sports place and other places. And the ESPN people have increasingly gotten more aggressive into the recruiting business and they ranked who, who they felt had the best recruiting classes. And so I was interested, of course, they did the top 75 schools, uh, which is, you know, a little, little more than half of all FBS universities and how they did in recruiting and they ranked them out. So I was interested. Bingo, Boise state 68th out of 130 some odd schools in recruiting. All right. That's, that's not bad. 
uh, could be worse. Uh, last year, according to the same survey, they were 66th in the country. Uh, what was a little concerning, and it's been happening increasingly, is this image and reputation within the group of five. And so they went so far as to rank Boise State's recruiting against the rest of the group of five, and they were eighth. And I, I thought that was interesting, whether it's accurate or not. We won't know for a couple of years. Uh, but it is, I guess, telling that there is some image slippage for the Boise State group of five dominant brand. Now, everybody knows they're still one of the top schools, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's a slam dunk that they are at the tops. I mean, uh, UT San Antonio with ESPN uh, out recruiting them, for example. And then, you know, the schools that are all going to the Big 12 still being ranked ahead of them, I thought was a little out of line. But anyway, what is concerning or interesting, depending upon how you want to look at it, is that the number one group of five uh, ranking went to Colorado State. Colorado State was ranked 59th overall in the country or uh, nine spots ahead of Boise State. Uh, Colorado State was the number one school that is a returning group of five member. Those schools that are going to the Big 12, forget about them. Uh, let's talk about Colorado State and everybody else that's uh, remaining. And if there's somebody that you can, I guess, point to that is the reason why Colorado State was the top recruiting uh, program not only in the Mountain West but in the group of five and you can point at this kid Damian Henderson don't know anything about him uh, but I do know that if you can get an ESPN 300 recruit uh, then you're going to jump up in their rankings you sort of support their agenda but I think it's always fun to sort of take a name like Damian Henderson a running back or athlete depending upon where Colorado State wants to put him Put a circle around him. It'll be fun to watch how he does, who he is, how good he is, what he can do, uh, where he goes from there, how long he stays at Colorado State. And, you know, his statistics as a senior, uh, 1,750 yards, 23 touchdowns. Uh, there's guys with stats like that that are better or worse. Uh, speaking of running backs, I did not see Dubar play, uh, Breezy. And uh, this he's, he's in Anna, Texas, which... Boise State's got a lot of kids out of Fresco, and it would be north of there. And it's a smaller school, and I think that scared a lot of schools away because they couldn't compare just how fast he really was or elusive he really was when maybe he was not playing the kind of competition that other running backs were and made it easier to make a decision about them because there wasn't a lot of big schools. Colorado may have been the only school that came in on him and – once Dion's people got in there, I think that scholarship wasn't offered anymore. So I, I don't know, or maybe it was the other way around. Dion came in on him. You know, those, those details would be a little different, but who else was chasing him? And, and there really wasn't a school in the power five that was interested in uh, giving him a scholarship and bringing him on board. I think there's a lot of transfer portal running backs as well. So I just found a couple of those points uh, interesting in the recruiting thing, you know, uh, Boise state still, you know, with another opportunity here to sign some kids uh, with a letter of intent day in February. But that uh, that date for a lot of schools is they really just come and gone and maybe for JC transfers and some of that. So I wouldn't expect many fireworks there. The transfer portal, lastly, has created a lot of news and attention. And so the first of the two windows for the transfer portal has ultimately closed, and that was as of January 19th. And you're still going to hear about it, though, because you've got kids in the portal that haven't landed yet, so they can still get recruited and land. And you've got graduate transfers who can get in there and do what they want and be eligible immediately. So, and it's getting complicated because, you know, sometimes graduate transfers get their degree in three years and still have two to play. I mean, it's pretty impressive. So, there's still some time here. There's still some portal activity, but I think for the most part, you'll have to wait till May 1st for another chance to leave your school. If you're not a graduate kid, you're an undergraduate. And with new rules from the NCAA, if this is your second transfer, you're going to have to come up with some reasons but uh, on why you need to transfer. But for everybody else, uh, you'll have to go through spring ball. And uh, I think coaches are getting the hang of that much easier. and. I hope that everybody's up front with each other and the coaches are understanding that 
hey, let's look at you at spring. Let you make the decision. You're thinking of transferring. Is this going to work out for you or not? Let's look at spring ball and see how that goes. Could make for some more spirited spring practices. That much I know for sure, and that's going to be here soon enough. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Kingdom of Pod on the Believe Podcast Network, all about Boise State football. Hey, pass it on. Um, tell somebody it's out there or just email them a copy of it. You can subscribe to it so that it's sent to you. If you don't know it, you're just listening to this each week. I also put it up on my YouTube site. You may want to, I don't know, look at my master's clock or Lakers clock or whatever else I have going on here in Flower Mound, Texas. Just pass it on, rate it, review it, tell them all about the kingdom of pod, and I'll talk to you again soon.